Chapter Four, Part One of Theo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosie. Theo by Francis Hodgson Burnett. Chapter Four, Part One. Theo's Diary. Upstairs, in a sacred corner of the chamber Lady Throckmorton had apportioned to her, Theodora North kept her diary. Not a solid, long-winded diary, full of creditable reflections upon the day's events, but, on the contrary, a harmless little book enough, a pretty little book, bound in pink and gold, and much ornamented about the corners, and greatly embellished with filigree clasps. Lady Throckmorton had given it to her because she admired it, and, in a very natural enthusiasm, she had made a diary of it, and here are the entries first recorded in its gilt-edged pages. December 7th. Mr. Oglethorpe was so kind as to remember his promise about showing me the lions. Enjoyed myself very much. Miss Priscilla Gower went with us. She is very dignified, or something, but I think I like her. I am sure I like her, so I will go to see her again. I wonder how it is she reminds me of Pamela, without being like Pamela at all. Poor Pam always so sharp in her ways, and I do not think Miss Gower ever could speak sharply at all. And yet she reminds me of Pam. December 14th went to the theatre again with lady throckmorton and mr oglethorpe i wonder if the rose-pink satin is not becoming to me i thought it was but before i went upstairs to dress mr oglethorpe said to me don't put on the rose-pink satin theodora i am sorry that he does not think it is pretty wore a thin white muslin dress and dear dearest old pamela's beautiful sapphires the muslin had a long train december eighteenth mr oglethorpe came to-night with a kind message from miss gower from these innocent extracts, persons of an unlimited experience might draw serious conclusions, but when she made said entries kneeling before her toilet table each night, our dear Theodora thought nothing about them at all. She had nothing else in particular to write about at present, so, in default of finding a better subject, she jotted down guileless remembrances of Dennis Oglethorpe and the length of her trains. But one memorable evening, on going into the sitting-room, with the pink and gold volume in her hand, she encountered Sir Dugald, who seemed to be in an extraordinary frame of mind, and withal nothing loath to meet her. "'What pretty book have you there, Theodora?' he asked, in his usual amiably uncivilized manner. "'It is my diary,' Theo answered. "'Lady Throckmorton gave it to me. I put things down in it.' "'Oh, oh!' was the reply, taking hold of both Sabre's ears and chuckling. "'Put things down, do you? What sort of things do you put down, eh, pretty Theodora? Lovers, eh? Literary man, eh?' Theo grew pink all over, pink as to cheeks, pink as to slim white throat, even pink as to small ears. She was almost frightened, and her fright was of a kind such as she had never experienced before. But it was not Sir Dougal she was afraid of, she was used to him. It was something new of which she had never thought until this very instant.' "'Literary man, eh?' Sir Dugald went on. "'Do you put down what their names are, and what they do, and how they make mistakes, and take the wrong young lady to see Norma and Faust and Il Travatore?' "'Il Travatore's a nice opera, Theo, and Leonora sounds something like Theodora. It doesn't sound anything like Priscilla, does it? The devil fly away with Priscilla, I say. Priscilla isn't musical, is it, Leonora?' Once having freed herself from him, which was by no means an easy matter, Theo flew upstairs, tremulous, breathless, flushed she did not stop to think she had seen the drawing-room empty and unlighted save by a dull fire on her way downstairs so she turned to the drawing-room she had been conscious of nothing but sir dugald so she had not heard the hall door open and not having heard the hall door open had of course not heard dennis oglethorpe come in so in running into the firelit room she broke in upon that gentleman who was standing in the shadow and it must be confessed was rather startled by her sudden entrance and curiously excited face he stopped her short, however, collectedly enough. "'What is the matter, Theodora?' he demanded. She slipped down upon a footstool, all in a flutter, when she saw him, she was so shaken, and then, in her sudden abasement and breathless tremor, gave vent to a piteous little half-sob, though she was terribly ashamed of it. "'I—I I don't know,' she answered him. "'It's—it's it's nothing at all.' But he knew better than that, and, guessing very shrewdly that he was not wholly unconnected with the matter himself, questioned her as closely as was consistent with delicacy, and, in the end, after some diplomacy, and a few more of surprised, piteous little unwilling half-sobs, gleaned a great deal of the truth from her. "'It was only—only only something Sir Dougal said about you and Miss Gower, and—and and something about me,' she added, desperately. 
oh he said looking so composed about it that the very sight of his composure calmed her and made her begin to think she had seen a mountain in a molehill sir dugald only sir dugald what did he say may i ask as it it is about myself and miss gower of course he might ask but the difficulty lay in gaining any definite answer theodora blushed and then actually turned a little pale looking wondrously abased in her uncalled-for confusion but she was not at all coherent in her explanations which were really not meant for explanations at all il travatore was so beautiful she burst out finally and so was faust and i had never been to the opera in all my life before and of course blushing and palpitating but still looking at him without a shade of falsehood in her innocent straightforward eyes of course i couldn't how could i be so silly and vain and presuming as to think of 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 she stopped here as might be expected and if the room had been light enough she might have seen a shadow fall in oglethorpe's face as he prompted her of what her eyes fell of what sir dugald said she ended in a troubled half whisper there was a slight pause in which both pairs of eyes looked down theodora's upon the rug of tiger skin at her feet oglethorpe's at theodora herself they were treading upon dangerous ground he knew and yet in the midst of his fierce anger at his weakness he was conscious of a regret a contemptible regret he told himself that the eyes she had raised to his own a moment ago had been so very clear and guilelessly honest in their accordance with the declaration her lips had made but my dear theodora he at length broke the silence by saying carelessly why should we trouble ourselves about that elderly goth or vandal if you choose sir dugald who does trouble themselves about sir dugald and his amiably ponderous jocoseness not lady throckmorton i am sure not society in general you must know consequently let us treat sir dugald with silent contempt in a glorious consciousness of our own spotless innocence he was half uneasy under his satirical indifference though he was so accustomed to conceal his thoughts under indifference and satire he was scarcely sure enough of himself at this minute but despite this he carried out the assumed mood pretty well we have no need to be afraid of sir dugald's vandalism if we have no fear of ourselves and considering as you so very justly observed that it is quite impossible for us to be silly and vain and presuming toward each other i think we must be quite safe i believe you said it would be impossible theodora just one breath space and theodora north looked up at him as it were through the influence of an electric flash of recognition there was a wild sweet troubled color on her cheeks and her lips were trembling her whole face seemed to tremble her very eyes had a varying tremulous glow quite impossible wasn't it theodora he repeated and though he had meant it for nothing more than a careless daring speech his voice changed in defiance of him and altered or seemed to alter both words and their meaning what in the name of madness he would have been rash enough to say next in response to the tremor of light and color in the upturned face it would be hard to say for here he was stopped as it were by fortune herself fortune came in the form of lady throckmorton fresh from trollope's last and in a communicative mood ah you are here dennis and you too theodora why are you sitting in the dark and as she bent over to touch the bell theodora rose from her footstool to make way for her rose with a little sigh as if she had just been awakened from a dream which was neither happy nor sad it was very plainly lady throckmorton's business to see and seeing understand the affairs of her inexperienced young relative but if lady throckmorton understood that theodora north was unconsciously endangering the peace of her girlish heart lady throckmorton was very silent or very indifferent about the matter but she was not moulded after the manner of the stern female guardians usually celebrated in love stories she was not mercenary and she was by no means authoritative she had sent for theo with the intention of extending to her the worldly assistance she had extended to pamela and beyond that the matter lay in the girl's own hands lady throckmorton had no high views for her in particular she wanted to see her enjoy herself as much as possible until the termination of her visit in whatever manner it terminated whether matrimonially or otherwise besides she was not so young as she had been in pamela's time and consequently though she was reasonably fond of her handsome niece and more than usually generous towards her she was inclined to let her follow her own devices for herself she had her luxurious little retiring room with its luxurious fires and lounges and after these or rather with these came an abundance of novels and the perfect creamy chocolate her french cook made such a masterpiece of novels and chocolate standing as elderly and refined dissipations 
and not being troubled with any very strict ideas of right or wrong, it would, by no means, have annoyed her ladyship to know that her handsome Theodora had outgeneraled her pet grievance, Priscilla Gower. Why should not Priscilla Gower be outgeneraled, and why should not Dennis marry someone who was as much better suited to him as Theodora North plainly was? Tut, tut, she said to Sir Dugald, why shouldn't they be married to each other? It would be better than Priscilla Gower if Theodora had nothing but Pam's grey satin for her bridal trousseau. So Theo was left to herself, and, having no confidant but the pink and gold journal, gradually began to trust to its page some very troubled reflections. It had not occurred to her that she could possibly be guilty in admiring Mr. Dennis Oglethorpe so much as she did, and in feeling so glad when he came, and so sorry when he went away. She had not thought that it was because he was sitting near her, and talking to her between the acts, that Il Travatore and Faust had been so thrillingly beautiful and tender, and this was quite true, even though she had not begun to comprehend it as yet. She had no right to feel anxious about him, and yet when, after having committed himself in the rash manner chronicled, he did not make his appearance for nearly two weeks, she was troubled in no slight degree. Indeed, though the thought was scarcely defined, she had some unsophisticated misgivings as to whether Miss Priscilla Gower might not have been aroused to a sense of the wrongs done her through the medium of Il Travatore, and so have laid an interdict upon his visits. But it was only Sir Dugald who had suggested this to her fancy. End of chapter 4, part 1. Recording by Rosie.